I have to say, I'm so excited to introduce our arts guest. It was love at first sight when I met him and his work. Patrick McGrath Muniz is without a doubt one of the most talented human beings I've ever met. I'm amazed that you show at my gallery. I am so lucky. I love everything you do. I'm super excited about your show coming up on October 19th. Reminiscence, Patrick McGrath Muniz. Welcome back to the Houston Hour. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Mr. McKinney. It's a pleasure to be here and honor. I have to say, yeah. the first time I saw your work was at a collector's house, and I just went, oh my God, this is amazing. And he said, hey, this guy lives in Houston. You should check him out. And <laughs> I did. And you had a great show early on at the Young Center, and mm -hmm. we went right from that to a show here. Is this your third show with me? This is the third show here, I yeah. believe, yes. Reminiscence, how do you say that in Spanish? Uh, reminiscencia. I have it both in English and Spanish because it's just reflective of who I am. Super important, yes. yes. I always tell artists, be yourself. Only you are you, and your work is authentically, only you could make this work. I think it's really great. I would like to start before we talk about the show. I'd like to talk about AI. So you had a talk that's on YouTube. You can see it on your mm -hmm. YouTube channel. You can see it on Heidi Von Fine Art YouTube. Where was that talk? The talk was recently at the Nuevo Mexicano Heritage Art Museum in Santa Fe, New Mexico. This is the museum formerly known as the Spanish Colonial Arts Museum and the Museum Hill. And we had this talk about AI, art, archetypes, and, and algorithms, and how narrative painting responds to that, how we as artists can use these tools, these new tech devices and apps in a useful, creative way. Well, AI scares me so much. I, I literally turned autocorrect off of my phone because <laughs> I felt like it was writing things that I did not intend yes. and changing things. And it scared me so much that I take longer to text now because it doesn't autofill because I turned that whole thing off. But I, I watched, I listened on NPR to this story where a guy was talking about composing music and then they were talking about, well, let's tell AI to make this thing that sounds like ABBA or whatever. And that music was so insincere mm -hmm. and not authentic, but clearly based on the ABBA thing I heard. And I I thought, wow, I'd love to see a comparison like that with art. And then you did one. Yes. And we're going to have a talk about that during your show, and you can watch this on YouTube. But talk about that because it's fascinating what you did. It's fascinating. I'm very skeptical, as always, with new technology, especially given the consumer culture environment where we are constantly bombarded by all these apps that they want to sell us through our phones and they want to get us hooked on all these addictive apps that really take on all of our time and they're consuming and just sucking all this information and data from us. But at the same time, I'm also trying to keep an open mind and see how useful it could be. I thought it was very you know, open-minded of you, actually, because yeah. you said to AI, give me something that looks like Patrick McGrath Mooney's. And there's yes. so much about you online that it was yes. easy for AI to do that. Yes, because what the AI apps and tools online do is they basically scrape the internet and they have all this huge database of images that they just pull out and then just scramble and put together and create all these weird combinations and collages of other artists as well. And I've heard a lot of arguments against AI on the basis of plagiarism. Sure, Because artists absolutely. feel like they are being robbed from their images and their creative insights, and that's quite valid. But I wanted to go into it with an open mind and explore and test it, put it to the test. What if the AI could do an art that is very similar to mine? What can I learn from it? And at the same time, seeing the limitations of it, exploit that as opportunities for me to create new art. It was very brave of you to do that. <laughs> and I loved your comments about the AI versions. But tell our listeners, what did you discover? What I discovered is that there are some limitations to AI. Of course, we all know when we see images of AI to... The uneducated eye, well, it's beautiful, of course. And even I see some value in these images, but at the same time, I can reflect on the, the generic qualities of it. it. It's soulless. That's right. And there's so many things that seem superfluous and shallow and very direct and illustrative. When CGI first came out, I hated it. And honestly, when the first movies were, they weren't the handmade animation. Yes. I'm like, oh, this is terrible. Now our eyes used to looking at it. Makes me sad to think that that probably will happen yes. going forward. But it just is lacking a soul. 
Well, absolutely, and that's a very good point. You brought the CGI. We remember the CGI in the early 90s and late 80s. It was really bad. But it was now, awful. But right now, it's just amazing. And I, I don't doubt for a moment that AI is going to go through the same transformation. Yeah. So that's why we have to be very watchful, mindful that it's here to stay. It's not going away, and it's going to get better. Just keeping that in mind, I found these very interesting insights on how AI interprets the places that I lived in before, right? I grew up in Aguadilla in Puerto Rico, very specific place where AI, sometimes if you prompt AI to describe or illustrate this place, they confuse it or mistake it for Rio de Janeiro or somewhere else. And also political art is it has its problems, its limitations. It's not impossible because if you go online and search for AI tools that want to do or allow to create political art, you'll find it. Also nudes, all, even pornography. Oh. So it's just opening up a, a Pandora's box of possibilities here. But what I found interesting is that it has some real limitations on telling personal stories. Things that are really personal to my own story, things that I grew up with that really belong to an era that is more proper to the analog experience. So your paintings are really detailed and they have a lot of references, including especially a lot of personal references that the AI couldn't possibly know. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I love that that there is that limit to what you do. So, and I just want to squeak in that you are originally born in New York. Yes. But, but you I... grew up in Puerto Rico and your mom's Puerto Rican. That's right. Yeah. And uh, I share this dual heritage, half Irish American, half Puerto Rican. And 25 years of my life were lived in an island and also happened to be in an, an analog experience without computers, without internet. Yeah. And then 25 years later, it's all digital, it's all internet and here in the States. So I find that juxtaposition and that balance between those two experiences, those two life experiences, now that I'm about to turn 50, quite interesting. I and know the, you're the, about to turn 50. <laughs> that becomes my guiding creative norm. Here. You've had so much success and you're not even 50. I'm super excited about that because the best is yet to come. You know, you I, do you have four shows this year? I have several shows. There's museum shows right now. And right now I have in at the Albuquerque Museum of And of, we have in the art. gallery when you come in, I've got a lot of ephemera and things, not just Patrick's art. But yeah, you're on the cover of beautiful cover of Albuquerque oh, Museum catalog. It's gorgeous. Thanks. Yeah. Appreciate it. The show that we have there, it's a group show. It's very nicely curated by Josie Lopez. It's titled Vivarium, Exploring Intersections of Art, Storytelling, and the Resilience of the Living World. And also I have... At at the museum that I just mentioned, the Nuevo Mexicano Heritage Arts Museum, formerly known as the Spanish Colonial Arts Museum, The Ugly History of the Beautiful. And we're also in conversations with Jana Gothschalk, who is the curator of that show for a future show, a solo show there. Amazing. And you were in Fort Worth, the second version of Soy de Tejas? Yes, but that is already... Yeah, but that yeah. was this year. Yeah. I'm yeah. talking about yes. everything you've, you've had yeah. going on this year because you're super busy and you yeah. have something at Evoke. At Evoke as well. We had the Fe. Summer Salon, yeah. yeah. Yes, and I would like to mention one more thing, which is I met this guy last year, I guess, who had fallen in love with your work from France and he got in touch with you and he created a documentary that we'll be talking about more once we're into the show, but it's called In the Belly of the Beast and and it's a feature-length documentary just about little old you. And yes. I just, oh my gosh, I just yes. love watching. I'm privileged to get to have seen the final cut. It hasn't debuted yet in the United States, but it's going to very soon. It yes. made its debut in June in France. And it's a lot of scenes of you in Houston. Yes. You and your studio. We get to watch you make a painting that we see get unveiled in the exhibition. And it's you here, your studio evoke, and then in Philadelphia. That's right, at Taller Puerto Rico in Philadelphia. That was last year, and it was two weeks of intensive recording. Is that all? Studio. That was only two weeks? That was two weeks, yeah. So cut into like... A full sh- feature-length film. Into, yeah. Wow. The- it's so good. He really got you. <laughs> I feel like he yeah. really got you. And I can't believe that's the fifth documentary to be filmed at my gallery. And I would just like to say, I've got a perfect face for radio. <laughs> Every time I see myself on film, I'm like, oh, my God, I need a face left. Anyway. And this was Christian Pasuelo, we should mention Christian him. Pasuelo. And yes. he's done uh, 30 documentaries. This yes. is a major filmmaker. He's been all over the world, in China and Africa and different countries, filming people's lives and, and the things they do. And he told me he came upon your work. And he was just 
instantly riveted. And this was in France. No one sent him anything. He just organically came upon it. And then a few months later, it happened again. And he said, I feel like I need to do something with this guy. And oh my gosh, it's so thoughtful. He really got you. And I would just like to say, I tell, you know, I endeavor through my gallery to sell works of art that are really great, but that are meaningful. And I was delighted that one of the works of yours that I own in my personal collection went on loan to that exhibition in Philadelphia. And it's in the catalog. And listeners out there, it's really cool. You know, you have good art when when museums borrow it for their exhibitions. Yes. So come here and I will get you set up with some yes. really good art. So let's talk about reminiscence. What's in the show? The show is really inspired after this curious phenomenon called the reminiscence bump that we usually experience when we're in our late 40s, 50s. Some people experience this earlier as these memories that start to surface with vivid clarity of our youth going back to those years that we grew up without the internet. And what got me to this thought and to this to this exploration of these ideas and these memories was the whole experimentation with AI and what it cannot replicate. These intricacies of the human memory and the emotions that are tied to it, that are very personal, deeply personal, and very sensorial in nature. So the work is really inspired by all these experiences, but I, I'm not illustrating them literally. I'm using allegories and occult symbolism from tarot, astrology, even old masters, art history as an inspiration. So it's multi-layered and polysemic and very intricate in detail. Not just technically, but conceptually. Well, and you reference a lot of different kinds of thoughts or not using the right word. I'm thinking about that painting that you did that had all the female deities on it, starting with the Venus of Willendorf and everybody else and how powerful that was. And what's so fun about your work is you make all these references. And if you can, if you know what they are, it's even cooler. When you get a work of Patrick's, he writes this narrative for each one and he tells you what's in there and what's this specific reference. I happen to be looking at a painting of yours right now while we're talking. And I'm like, I know that's your house in Puerto Rico, (laughs) right? And other people looking at that wouldn't know that. But you'll get that when you come look at the work, all the different references. But it's very sophisticated, but it's very specific spiritual. Yes. But it's not religious. No, no. I don't consider my work religious at all. Some people might see the politics in it. There is some of that, but of course we live in a world that's just bombarded by consumerism, colonialism, yeah. climate change. All those things are real and they're just unavoidable. So my work is going to deal with all of that. But the main idea that I want to derive from all of that is how I perceive it and how I reinterpret it as an artist, because I'm very much mindful of the fact that I'm going to be biased by my own experiences. Growing up in an island that's been isolated, you know, in, in a way that has this colonial mentality. Because it is. Because it is yeah. still to this day. So, And I'm very much aware of it with all its beauty and flaws and everything. And I carry that with me even here. I got to ask you, you occasionally make this reference to this, I guess it's a Puerto Rican deity that's sort of triangular. Oh, yeah, the semi. Yeah. What, what is that? That derives from Taino culture. So the Tainos were the natives of Puerto Rico before the time of Columbus. So they had these idols or these effigies of their deities that were carved out of stone and they were triangular in shape. They're very reminiscent of the mountains, but they are fertility symbols. And I use them once in a while to I see allude them to in that. there. Yes, they uh, are there. So those are some obscure references that not everyone is going to be familiar with, yeah. which makes the work a lot more interesting because you know I'm, I'm just delving deep into to history, art history, and very specific ideas that come from the Americas. Well, and you're also influenced by the tarot. I have right here, guys, you can't see it, but I'm looking at it. I'm holding it right now. A tarot Neocolonial de las Americas deck and book set by Patrick McGrath Muniz. You made this wonderful tarot deck with U.S. Games, the, yes. the tarot company. Yes. And you have them all the cards that we recognize, if you know what the tarot is, but rendered with your perspective, yes. your unique perspective. And we had at one point sold some of the drawings that didn't make it in, yes. I think. And you exhibited the drawings at the Young Center. You yes. had that tarot show. Talk about the tarot. It's A lot of people don't realize it dates to yes. the Renaissance yes. and what it is and why it's interesting to you. Well, the main idea behind the tarot, which I find the most interesting, is not the fortune-telling aspects to of it that most people are familiar with, it, right? 
the divination aspects of it, but more the historical context and the fact that they really represent a set of archetypes right. that are universal in nature and that there's much more to be learned from ourselves than from the future by reading these cards. And that's how I use these cards as a tool of creative insight for my own work, not as a means to knowing what's going to happen next year or anything, but more like what am I, what am I tapping into? What kind of vibration or energy or archetypal force am I trying to tap into in order to create this specific artwork? Mm -hmm. You know, so I feel like these are in a way informing my work very much like the algorithms are guiding us through our own understanding of technology. So they go hand in hand, archetypes and algorithms. I've been fascinated by both and I see how one feeds into the other. Yeah. Oh, it is pretty fascinating. Well, I describe your work as you know, inspired by Renaissance and the Spanish colonial old masters. But you have a color palette that's specific to a particular artist who you admired. Is that right? Yes. But I've been, as of late, I've been freeing myself more and more from that. But okay. It, it is Jose Campeche that you're yes. referring to. Yes, it's a Puerto Rican painter from the 18th century, from the arguably, Spanish colonial Arguably, other period. than you, probably the most famous artist from Puerto Rico. Uh, yeah, there are other artists as well. Are there? <laughs> that's a, I think are that's there? A... <laughs> okay. Well, he's a big one. <laughs> yeah, he's a big one for me yeah. at least. Yes, yeah. a big inspiration, yes. So you do have a pretty exuberant palette. And yes. I love watching you on social media because we get to watch you mix the pigments and make art. And it is October Inktober? Oh, Inktober is in the month of October that there's this art challenge on social media that many artists follow. You rock it. <laughs> so talk Thanks. about that for a second, will you? Yeah. Artists do one drawing per day. It has to be ink. That's the main requirement. And you do it for the full month of October. That's called Inktober. Yeah. And you sell those. Yeah, online. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's a very, that's a That's, that's a, good. I that's love that. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. So, and when we have shows together, we show a sketchbook. I put it in a vitrine so yes. people can't handle it, but you yeah. or I open it and turn pages and things, and people love to see yeah. that. And it's this, like, so you went to the Savannah College of Art and Design, SCAD, and you also taught there, right? Yeah, I was a TA. TA. Yes. Okay, but yeah. you can draw. I did teach before. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you yeah. can draw, man, and it's <laughs> real Thanks. clear. Now that you mentioned that, and and sorry to interrupt, but I really want to, before I forget, that I am going to include having drawings in this show. There are seven drawings that are framed on this, besides the paintings that are like altarpieces, tondos, retablos, triptychs, and oil paintings on canvas. But we will also have drawings in the exhibition. Yes, and I love the fact that your shows have works of art that are in all price ranges. Yes. It's nice. And some of them are quite small. So something that I hear from people is like, "Eh, I don't have any more room. Like, no, you got room for this. There's always room for a drawing or a small painting. <laughs> There's always room for one more. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's Lester Marx's motto. Always room for one more. So how long have you been working on the show? Uh, it's been, I'd say, over a year already. You are working the, on... the whole idea. You're working on several things at the same time. Yes. I've seen that in yes. your studio, and I think that's really cool. And I would just like our listeners yes. to know, boy, when you own the work of a living artist who you can know personally, you have a totally different relationship with your art. A lot of times people say, like, oh, we just buy what we like. Yes. Well, it's way different when you know the artist personally. Yeah. My whole program at the gallery is everyone lives here. I represent established artists who are living and working in Houston and showing in museums. And you can, you know, on occasion go to a studio visit or at a minimum go to their artist talk. And that's a totally different thing when the artist is talking about their work to you. You know, it's just really very special. But I've seen you with multiple easels out and things in different phases of where they're at, and you just do what the mood strikes you? or uh, It just really comes out of the whole process of drawing, reading, and even the tarot comes into play. So it's a very complex, multi-layered process. You know, a lot of introspection, a lot of meditation before the work comes about. So that's why I say a year. Okay. And so how much time would you say you spend thinking about something before you even start to paint it? Months. Months. Yes. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, I love that. I love that. And your greatest inspiration is just life? Yeah. Pop culture? Life, history, memories? Yeah. uh, The things that make me me and that I know that are almost nearly impossible to be replicated by a machine. Yes, That's more important. That's For me, that's one of the main 
requirements for me to yeah. make art at this moment in time. And the link of history plus the present is yes. always evident in every yes. single thing you Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Yeah. We try Love to find that. a connection and the hidden connections and forces that are driving everything. That- so your show's opening in a week, Saturday the 19th at Heidi Von Fine Art, 3510 Lake Street at Colquitt. We're in Houston's oldest gallery row since the 1970s, guys. Mm. And we have our openings together, so it's fun. It's like an art walk about every six weeks. And the show opens at 11 in the morning. The party's from 5 to 8. And I always love to encourage people to wear something special. So I wonder what people should wear to your opening. That's a great idea. Yeah. I would suggest bring anything that reconnects you with your childhood. <gasps> I yeah. love or that. Oh, yeah. To feel young. Feel young. Feel- what makes us human? You know, the things that make us really resonate with that younger side of ourselves. Love that. Because that's what this show is really about. Right. Reconnecting with, with our human essence. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, and Patrick, let people know where they can get a hold of you. Your social media handles, maybe your website. How can they get a hold of you? Yes. Just you can look me up, Patrick McGrath Muniz, or through Heidi Vaughn's Fine Art Gallery website. And we're at the show as well. There you go. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to break for some messages and come back with more of the Houston Hour on 90.1 KPFT Houston.